Clinical Chemistry, Pre-Analytical Variables. This is a list of the learning objectives that are relevant to this section. Collecting a valid specimen, pre-analytical errors, and controllable and uncontrollable vari variables all contribute to validating patient results, releasing correct or uh, precise results, and diagnosing effective, effectively. Some common pre-analytical errors are listed below. Incorrect or missing test orders. So that comes from the ordering physician. They may forget to put in the test orders on time uh, before the patient shows up to um, get their blood collected or whatever specimen that they're supposed to get collected. Or they may accidentally put in the wrong errors. Typically someone in specimen processing would ensure that those orders are present before moving them on to the technologists um, or the clinical chemists. And the clinical chemist's job is to kind of um, make sure that the test that was ordered makes sense for that patient. So there are certain tests, uh, test codes that exist in healthcare systems that just um, probably wouldn't make sense. So that's where the clinical chemist who has the knowledge of all the different tests available would then um, call to confirm that that was the test that the physician would really uh, like to be ordered. Improper patient preparation. So that has to do with communication to the patient and then the patient's ability to follow that communication. So if the patient was supposed to fast for 12 hours or for a certain period of time, that uh, information has to be accurately communicated to the patient and then the patient has to actually do it. If the patient doesn't do it and kind of lies about it, then you can see that there's improper patient preparation and it's difficult to control that aspect. Incorrect sampling time of day. So sometimes different types of specimens need to be collected in the morning or in the evening. So there's different times of day that it would need to be collected. For um, cardiac markers, those have a very specific time of where they would no longer be relevant. So if a patient has had heart pain uh, or heart attack like symptoms for a week, um, you know, different types of markers may not be present for that long in the bloodstream. So you may not see um, myoglobin, for example, being elevated. Incorrect order of draw. So there's a very specific order that has to be followed when the phlebotomist draws the blood, especially, you know, when there's multiple tubes that are being drawn on a patient. We want to draw from the tubes that have the least amount of stuff to them all the way up to the most amount of stuff. Um, we also have to consider um, anticoagulants. And if we put a needle into something that has powder anticoagulant and then put a needle into a tube that has a um, coagulant activator, we may have some of that powder carry from tube to tube. So we have a specific order that we recommend that the tubes are drawn in. So following that is an important aspect as a phlebotomist. Inappropriate or faulty specimen containers. So inappropriate being um, maybe they use the wrong blood tube for a particular test. So there's different types of additives that we put into a blood tube. Um, for example, you wouldn't be able to use a tube that has a clotting activator in it in order to do a whole blood cell count because the blood cells are going to be clotted at that point and you won't be able to see them. So um, choosing the correct uh, tube to use or faulty specimen containers. So if the caps weren't completely on the tubes when they were sent down to the lab, they could leak all over the bag and then we can't run um, those, those samples. Hemolyzed or insufficient samples. So this again um, relies on the phlebotomy. So hemolyzed is typically due to an incorrect needle size um, for the patient. So um, and different types of techniques can lead to hemolysis. So that typically lands on the responsibility of the phlebotomist. And insufficient samples, not getting enough blood into the tube or enough sample into that. This is particularly difficult with um, like neonates trying to get enough blood. Um, sometimes they have different techniques of like scraping the back of the heel and getting blood out of there. Um, but yeah, making sure that there is enough sample to be run on the analyzer is important. Inadequate sample mixing. So um, if you don't mix the tubes when those are drawn appropriately, it could lead to clotted, um, um, microclots could exist, incomplete clotting due to fibrin interference. So you wanna make sure that when you draw particular tubes that you are 
mixing them appropriately at that time. Incorrect or missing sample. So sometimes when you're working in specimen processing, the bag comes and there's just no blood tube for that particular test that was ordered. Um, there may be other blood tubes in the bag, but they aren't appropriate samples to be used for the test that was on the order. So um, if you have the wrong sample or no sample at all, that could be um, a source of preanalytical error. Incorrect or missing specimen identification. This is probably one of the most um, common things that we see and one of the most um, easy things to correct. So if we uh, draw patient's blood, we wanna immediately label that blood with the patient's identification. And then we want to verify that the patient's identification is correct. Sometimes when a physician orders different blood tests, um, multiple labels will be printed off at once. So the phlebotomist rips off the labels, grabs some tubes, goes to the patient. And the first thing they should do is ask them to verify their name and date of birth. And then once they verify that, they're going to draw the blood and then they're gonna label the blood tubes after the blood draw. And then they want to hand those tubes back to the patient and confirm, is this you? So doing those simple steps um, may seem like it wastes some time, but it really does decrease the incidence of um, incorrect or missing specimen identification. Just getting that in the routine of the phlebotomist, make sure that that's accurate. Sometimes labels can come off of the tubes within the bags as they're being transported down to the lab or over to the lab. Um, those tubes have to be recollected because the, the sticker, the label has to actually be on the tube. It can't be in the bag next to the tube. So those have to be um, recollected unless there's some type of handwritten um, name or identifier on the blood tube itself. There's no way to ensure that that tube actually um, was from that patient. And it's not good um, you know, to report results on the incorrect patient. So you wanna make sure that the tube you're putting on there is labeled appropriately. You can confirm that that is the patient and um, you know, do those checks and balances before analyzing results and reporting those results to the patient. Inappropriate transport conditions. So we'll talk more about this as we go through here, but um, sometimes specimens need to be refrigerated or frozen, or they need to be shielded from light. So transporting them is another issue. Um, specimens can break during transport, they can open up. So making sure that all of that is taken into consideration with the couriers that deliver specimens um, from one location to the next, but also with um, intra-hospital transport and a lengthy transport time. So most specimens should be evaluated within four hours, but if you let the specimens sit out for a lengthy period of time or don't get them to processing fast enough, then that could lead to errors. A lot of times um, people don't wanna get in trouble at work, so <laughs> they'll be like, no, I you know, just uh, collected this and then send it down to the lab when really uh, the analytes that we're using for are in the process of breaking down or the test will not be effective if there's a delayed transport time, especially when we're talking about molecular type tests or um, evaluating the presence of RNA. Um, RNA is very unstable with it being single stranded and such. So that's something that um, to take into consideration that lengthy transport time and the type of transport is really important to prevent these pre-analytical errors. Types of specimens. So biological specimens include whole blood, serum plasma, urine, feces, saliva, various fluids, and various types of solid tissue. The Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, procedures uh, have procedures for standardized specimen collection, and those are followed. So we're not going to go through all of those procedures for specimen collection in this course, um, and those are more for like a phlebotomist or um, a nurse that's going to be collecting the special specimens from the patients. If you are an MLS or a clinical chemist, you're rarely going to do the specimen collection yourself. Sample vari variables, so physiologic considerations, proper patient preparation, problems in collection, transportation, processing, and storage are all things that I just described. One new topic here is the chain of custody. So some specimens are chain of custody specimens. They're lab tests that are related to a crime or accident and they're forensic. 
Documented specimen identification is required at each phase of the process. Um, the signatures have to be um, given any time that the custody of the specimen changes hands, and there should be a tamper-proof seal. When collecting blood, vein puncture and arterial puncture are two different routes. So vein puncture, you want to make sure that um, patient identification is verified. You're using personal protective equipment. Queries regarding fasting and medication are had. So you want to confirm with the patient, did you fast for so many hours? Or you want to confirm, like, what medications are you taking at this time? Did you take any um, Tylenol, for example, this morning or anything like that? Proper positioning and vein and site selection. So depending on the patient, that's a call that is made of which vein would be more appropriate to collect blood. Appropriate needle, tubes, and other equipment. The timing of the collection, which is something that I talked about, time of day, even time of um, since the incident is important. And then the effects of the tourniquet and stress. So if the patient is extremely stressed, if the tourniquet's on too tight, um, that may lead to uh, um, some possible hemolysis, some stress hormones that may cause interference, and so forth. Arterial puncture is reserved for blood gas analysis in serious illness, and the preferred site is in the wrist, so the radial artery, and you want to check for the pulse before drawing blood to make sure that it is an artery, because if you recall from AMP classes, so um, you're going to feel the pulse in arteries, you're not going to feel a pulse in veins because after arteries it goes through the capillaries which slows down the flow of blood and on the vein side it's trying to go back to the heart so um, veins are a lot larger diameter, they allow for flow of fluids, depend on muscle contractions to move the fluid as opposed to the heart um, pumping the blood to the extremities so you want to check for a pulse. Plasma versus serum. So plasma and serum, those terms are sometimes used interchangeably, um, but if you've taken uh, AMP or any type of um, hematology course, you know that plasma is um, all of the liquid components of blood, while serum is the liquid components minus the blood cells and clotting elements. There's different additives that can be um, contained within different types of tubes, and usually the tube tops are color-coded, um, especially within a health healthcare system, but they're pretty um, standardly color-coded throughout the United States. So we can see uh, just a red top is a plain tube. There's no additive in it. We can have a serum tube that has clot activator in it, so it's going to encourage the formation of blood clots so that all of the cells are kind of out of the way and it leaves you with serum. The SSGT T tube has gel and clot activator. The goal of the gel is to separate the cells from the serum so that on top of the gel is the serum and it's easier to just pour off the serum or run, run your tests without having to worry about getting any of those blood cells in the way. EDTA contains EDTA as an anticoagulant. Those are typically lavender. Heparin tube, um, so sodium heparin, lithium heparin, again, another anticoagulant. A glucose tube, uh, potassium oxalate and sodium fluoride. ESR contains sodium citrate, and then a PT tube con uh, contains sodium citrate, and you can see the different colors that exist. Proper identification is essential, as I mentioned previously. All specimens are treated as if infectious, so there's no special labeling that goes on a blood tube. It's just everything's treated as it were to cause infectious diseases. The need for adequate lab labeling, regardless of size or treatment of the container, is important. You want to label the container rather than the lid or the cap, because lids or caps can fall off, but the container is going to contain the actual patient specimen. So you can always replace the cap with the appropriate patient specimen if the tube was actually, or the container was the one that was labeled. Preservation of specimens, you want to use the proper container, labeling, make sure you have careful transport. 
There are sometimes temperature and light constraints, as I mentioned previously. You have um, some specimens that are required to be in the fridge or in the freezer um, or are protected from light. The separation of serum and plasma. Some tests require that you pour off the serum or plasma before sending it out for evaluation. Hemolysis is also a big one. Um, hemolysis must re be reported. Hemolysis doesn't mean that all tests or all patient specimens that end up hemolyzed have to be recollected, but hemolysis is important to note for certain test results such as um, potassium. Since potassium is in predominant intracellular uh, cation, it should be inside of the cells. So if we have our cells breaking open, then potassium is going to leak out, and that could cause ele uh, falsely elevated levels of potassium. Um, so noting that it's a hemolyzed specimen is important. The challenges of RNA recovery. RNA is very unstable. It's a um, you know single strand uh, molecule that can break down very easily. So it's difficult to recover RNA. And then remote facilities. So sometimes um, remote facilities have to have their specimens sent to a central lab or sent to a reference uh, lab. So being able to preserve the specimen until it gets to that location for analysis is important. The separation of plasma and serum as soon as possible, but not prematurely. So you want to make sure if it's serum that it, you give it an opportunity to clot and then you can pour it off. Room temperature uh, storage if centrifugation is not possible in the normal window. Freezer or cold storage after centrifugation. Centrifugation with the stopper in place prevents the evaporation or aerosolization of any of the specimen. Absolutely necessary for volatiles and it maintains anaerobic conditions. pH changes induced by removal of the stopper before centrifugation are also something to make note of. Cryopreservation, it's useful in preserving white blood cells and DNA, prevention, um, preventing shearing of DNA, and thorough mixing after thawing is required. So during specimen processing, you want to have a correct match of blood collection tube with the appropriate analyte request and patient identification labels. Centrifugation, noting the presence of any serum or plasma characteristics, so hemolysis or icterus or turbidity associated with lipemia, or blood clotting. You want to analyze samples within four hours if possible. Proper capping and protection from areas of rapid airflow, light, and heat to minimize the evaporation. Refrigeration at 4 degrees Celsius for 8 hours or freezing at minus 20 for longer periods if later testing is required. Some specimens can't be refrigerated or frozen, so once collected they have to be processed pretty immediately or they won't be stable. So it all depends on what test was ordered. So centrifugation, that's part of specimen processing. Sometimes it's also part of um, phlebotomy, so collecting the specimens. Centrifugation allows for the separation of more dense substances from less dense substances. So more dense substances will go to the bottom of the tube, less dense will go to the top. So you put a tube in a centrifuge and it spins around and round and round and using centrifugal force, the more dense substances will go to the bottom. Using centripetal force, the less dense substances will go toward um, the top of the tube. And that allows for the separation of plasma and serum from the blood cells. So going back to the slide here, use of centrifugal force to separate particles in a mixture based on size, shape, density, and viscosity. Materials move away from the axis rotation due to centrifugal force. So the difference between centrifugal or centripetal force is centrifugal is moving away from the axis, while centripetal is moving toward the axis. Some protocols still list RPM for um, how to centrifuge different specimens. 
RPM or revolutions per minute is dependent on the radius. So it's inappropriate to have a protocol or to follow a protocol based on RPM. You always want to try to convert it to RCF, which is relative centrifugal force. RCF calculation is there at the bottom. 1.12 times 10 to the negative 6 times RPM times radius. Be familiar with how to calculate um, RCF that may come up on one of your qualifying exams. There's fixed angle and swinging bucket types of centrifuges. Fixed angle are pictured here at the top. So they have a fixed angle that you put the tube in. It allows for uh, fast and shorter path length and it's good for pelleting or density separation. So fixed angle we like to use in um, molecular diagnostics, for example, to kind of pellet away the cells from the genetic material that we're trying to isolate. Swinging bucket is good for density gradients. It allows for the gentle separation of cells. The downfall is that it's slower, but this one um, is more useful in separating blood. Centrifugation at the wrong speed can also lead to um, a speed or RCF can also lead to hemolysis. So we want to make sure that we're following appropriate centrifugation procedures. Some factors to consider for centrifugation. Use proper tubes. So the force can break tubes at certain speeds. So you want to make sure that you're using tubes that can withstand the force of the centrifuge. Cover all tubes. You never want to put a tube in uncovered. Balance the tubes. Balance the tubes means that when you're putting a specimen, and I'll go back to the picture, if you're putting a specimen on one side, a specimen of equal mass has to be on the other side because that will balance it. And when this spins, it'll spin nicely. If you forget to put the balance on there, this will pull the axis every time it goes around in multiple directions. So the entire machine is going to be wobbling all over the place and eventually break the axis. So you always have to have a balance. So if you put a tube on this side over here, you want to make sure that a tube of equal um, mass is on the other side as well. Know the speed limitations on the centrifuge and the tubes. There's a lot of different centrifuges out there. And if a protocol says that you have to have a particular RCF for this test, you want to make sure to select the centrifuge that can withstand that type of speed. Check the machine prior to use. You always want to look for debris, make sure that the cover is tightened, etc. So um, a story from when I was working in the clinical lab, I was in specimen processing at the time and one of my colleagues thought it was funny to put a glove with um, some dry ice inside of it and put it uh, in the centrifuge so that it would pop and I would hear the noise and freak out about the centrifuge. Um, obviously that person got let go for <laughs> uh, not following appropriate um, protocol, but uh, I hadn't looked in the centrifuge and it didn't make a loud popping noise. I think I had stepped away. Um, so this glove was still inside of the centrifuge when I went to go start it. Luckily, I remembered to look in there and I pulled the glove out, but that's something to keep in mind. If that glove had been in there, that would burn up the centrifuge, and centrifuges cost quite a bit of money, so um, you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. It could also um, invalidate the uh, patient specimens and cause for recollection of all those patient specimens. So you want to make sure that all debris are clear, that no dust or dirt or um, anything like that flew into the centrifuge before using it. Make sure the appropriate rotor is in place and secured. So you want to make sure the part that you're going to put the tubes into, called the rotor, you want to make sure it's tightened to uh, best that you can tighten it. It's usually tightened in counterclockwise, so it seems like you're tightening it in the wrong direction. But most centrifuges are going to spin in a clockwise manner. So if we tighten it in a counterclockwise manner, we're not spinning against the tightening. So we're not loosening it as we're spinning it. Wait until the centrifuge reaches the desired speed before walking away. I've done this so many times <laughs> where I put the tubes in there and then I walk away thinking that, oh, it started and it didn't get up to the appropriate speed because there was some type of error flag that read on the machine. It does take 
you know, maybe a couple minutes or, um, you know, several seconds before it gets up to that appropriate speed. So you want to stand there and watch and make sure that there's no errors. Once it's at the speed that you, it should be at to perform the centrifugation that you requested the machine, it's pretty safe. You can walk away at that time, but um, making sure it gets up to speed before walking away will save you some additional frustrations down the road. Wait until the centrifuge comes to a complete stop before removing the tubes. That seems like common sense. Um, some of our quick centrifuge um, apparatuses allow you to open the cover while it's still spinning. You never want to do that. You want to make sure that it's completely stopped. More of our advanced centrifuges don't even let you open the cover until it's completely stopped spinning. So you want to make sure that you're not abruptly stopping it because abruptly stopping a centrifuge is not only going to have some wear and tear on the centrifuge, but it's also going to cause the mixing of the specimen. So all that centrifugation that you just performed, well now it's ruined because there was a sudden jolt or shaking of the tube. Something else to consider that's not listed here is when you remove the tubes from the centrifuge, you want to practice caution so that you're not remixing the tubes after they're removed. So you want to be gentle and careful with them. And then typically once they're removed, they're going to be transported somewhere. So you, again, during that transport process, you don't want to be shaking the tubes, mixing them, um, allowing the rack to drop. Um, if anything like that happens, you have to go through the centrifugation process again. So transport of specimens, specimens from referral laboratories or outlying clinics, verification of quality, CLIA certification, also CLIA regulates how uh, specimens should be transported. There's different methods for shipping DNA specimens. There's regulations for biological specimens, airline transport precautions, um, and it all comes down to time and cost. There are specific guidelines that every clinical laboratory has to follow, and those guidelines are in place not only to make sure that we're doing things cost effectively and timely, but also to make sure that when we get tubes to where they need to go and we analyze them on the analyzers that we do, that the results are going to still be valid at that time. We also want to make sure that these specimens are getting from point A to point B safely. So we want to make sure that they're not going to open and cause like bloodborne pathogen exposure or anything like that. So we follow these regulations and guidelines to prevent pre-analytical errors, um, errors in reporting results, but also for safety issues and time and cost issues.